Thanks very much. Uh, so I wanted to give an update on uh, some uh, data that we published uh, earlier this year. Uh, these are my um, conflicts. Uh, none of them relate to uh, anything that I'm about to present. So the data that I'm going to present is, uh, is developed from a, a cohort uh, that was a community-based cohort uh, we call ADAPT. And it initially recruited 105 patients in the first wave in Sydney, Australia. And the way we recruited this was we took, uh, we recruited people as they came to a community testing site uh, and then consented people to be contacted if they had a positive uh, PCR result. Uh, importantly, the PCR that was performed was a multiplex PCR that detected uh, 20 different respiratory pathogens, including flu, RSV, and the four prevalent coronaviruses, as well as SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we commenced uh, this study in April, uh, May 2020, and we've followed this first group of patients out to two years now, and that's the data I'm going to present. 90% of this population were managed in the community, about 10% were uh, hospitalised and about 2% ended up in ICU. Uh, and approximately one third were symptomatic at a median of uh, 80 days post-infection and their main symptoms were fatigue, dyspnea, chest tightness and brain fog. So the uh, classical sort of long COVID uh, symptomatology. Uh, and the predictive factors for this were the severity of the uh, original disease and uh, being female. So uh, this is just uh, summarizing that data in a more uh, granular fashion and comparing on the left uh, the symptoms in acute COVID compared to those at four and eight months uh, after initial infection. And you can see that uh, whereas fatigue and headache uh, and cough dominated uh, the acute phase of the uh, illness uh, with this ancestral strain in an unvaccinated population. Uh, the post-COVID uh, symptoms were mostly around fatigue and uh, shortness of breath. Uh, and between the four and eight months, uh, those, uh, this, the, those that uh, had long COVID at, at four months still uh, mostly had long COVID at, at eight months, uh, though there were some uh, people, uh, a small percentage of people that developed uh, symptomatology late. So uh, we took uh, the 31 patients uh, who we uh, defined as having long COVID and uh, sex and age matched them with uh, controls. And importantly, I think in terms of the specificity of, uh, of the uh, biomarkers, we had uh, 25 uh, patients who were being followed post-infection with the prevalent coronaviruses that had been diagnosed at the same time from the same population. And we also had a bunch of healthy controls that we'd recruited for a different study uh, in early 2019. And so initially we examined these at four and eight months and, uh, and we've recently just uh, finished the analysis uh, at 24 months post-diagnosis. And I just remind you that because of the timing, they were all uh, unvaccinated uh, at the time of uh, recruitment. Uh, and all were infected with the ancestral strain. And so that limits uh, the interpretation of, of what I'm going to tell you in terms of relevance to today. Um, <clears throat> so we did a bunch of serum analytes. Uh, I'm not going to read through them all, but we chose a range of antiviral cytokines, mostly interferons and the downstream uh, signaling uh, cascade of interferons, markers of T cell activation, uh, markers of myeloid uh, cell and acute phase uh, activation, uh, endothelial and adhe adhesion markers, uh, and uh, ACE2. And we also performed uh, uh, a range of uh, T and myeloid cell flow cytometry. Uh, importantly, there was no difference in the viral load between uh, the uh, long COVIDs and matched controls at diagnosis, whether we judge this by the E or N genes. Uh, and 
what we found, and I found this very surprising, and I have to say that I probably wouldn't have believed the data if we hadn't had that uh, control of people with the uh, uh, prevalent coronavirus, which is the third uh, set of data uh, in each of these uh, uh, panels. Uh, we uh, had increase of uh, these six uh, uh, biomarkers, uh, which are dominated by uh, an interf interferon uh, uh, molecules. So we had raised uh, interferon beta, interferon lambda, uh, CXCL9, CXCL10, uh, IL-8, and to a lesser extent, soluble TIM3. But they were equally raised at this four-month period in both the long COVID and matched controls, and there was no difference uh, between uh, the levels uh, for most of these markers, and particularly of uh, the uh, interferon uh, uh, molecules, interferon beta and interferon lambda, as well as CXCL9 and CXCL10. So that suggested that there was uh, uh, ongoing inflammation uh, four months post the infection, regardless of symptoms. Uh, sorry. So uh, when we looked at eight months, uh, in a lot of the uh, uh, these biomarkers, we uh, had we we saw falls uh, in uh, the levels in the uh, matched controls, uh, uh, and so shown here with the interferon beta, the matched control uh, levels had fallen, but uh, were maintained uh, in the uh, long COVIDs. Uh, similarly, in the interferon lambda, uh, there was uh, the the levels were still raised uh, in the uh, uh, long COVIDs, but had dropped in the match controls. And then in each of the other uh, of those uh, biomarkers, we uh, saw uh, equivalent drops uh, in uh, the uh, long COVID and match controls. So the, the signals seem to be uh, restricted at eight months to interferon beta and interferon lambda. Uh, we also measured H, uh, ACE2, and again, we saw no difference uh, and a si similar trajectory in terms of resolution towards uh, uh, normal levels of uh, ACE2 in, uh, in the peripheral blood. Uh, we, at that stage, uh, took all the data and uh, applied machine learning with a log linear classification model uh, and uh, found that uh, in, in our uh, best modeling of this, uh, we, uh, that each model uh, included interferon beta uh, and the uh, cytokines that came up in the uh, models of best fit were interferon beta, pentraxin 3, which we heard a little bit about yesterday, uh, interferon lambda and IL-6. Uh, and uh, in also some of these interferon gamma came up. Uh, and this segregated uh, quite well uh, with about 80% accuracy between long COVID and the matched controls at eight months. So uh, we continued to review the clinical status of these uh, patients out uh, to 24 months uh, with blood draws at 18 and 24 months. And I'm going to uh, just present the 24 week, uh, month data uh, and so we had good retention uh, with 59 of the uh, 61 patients uh, uh, with, uh, in those two groups uh, uh, returning for those visits. Uh, they had, however, been uh, vaccinated, all, all of those had been vaccinated, uh, either with uh, AstraZeneca or one of the two RNA vaccines, and they had, as they had become available sequentially from April 21 in Sydney. Uh, they had had their second vaccine. Uh, all of them had uh, were compliant with the two uh, vaccine regime, uh, and most of them had their second vaccine. They had their second vaccine between July and October in 21, and uh, about two thirds of them had uh, their third vaccine, and they received that between November and, uh, 21 and February 22. And I think this confuses the 18-month data, so that's why I'm not going to present that here, but. There'll be a presentation later this afternoon about the effects of vaccination. Uh, in terms of uh, the 24-month uh, visit, uh, th that, was, that happened at an average of about three months from the third vaccination. Uh, and the long COVID uh, symptoms had resolved in 10 of the 28 uh, patients at, uh, with long COVID, who initially had long COVID at 24 months. 
And interestingly, uh, three patients had developed the symptomatology and two of these, uh, uh, two who developed this, uh, we could document uh, this seemed to be related to COVID reinfection. And across the cohort, apart from the vaccinations, four had had uh, COVID uh, reinfection during the two year period. So at the 24 month period, uh, we just took the uh, six uh, cytokines that had come up reproducibly in that model. Uh, and there was no difference between the uh, long, uh, long COVID and match controls for most of the analytes, but the interferon beta remained uh, elevated uh, uh, or significantly different uh, in the uh, long COVID patients. Uh, whereas the match controls, you can see, had mostly returned to uh, uh, the level of detection. Uh, and uh, we also saw uh, a possible signal with interferon uh, uh, gamma, uh, but no um, signal for interferon lambda. So restricted to interferon beta. So in terms of the flow cytometry, we looked at uh, traditional sort of T, t cell subsets, B cell subsets, myeloid, uh, and uh, we also looked at functional uh, responses, which again will be presented this afternoon. Uh, we found that there, at the four month time point, there were depletion of uh, a number of subsets and particularly uh, resting subsets of naive uh, B cells and naive T cells, as well as um, uh, loss of uh, certain effector, CD8 effector subsets. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, we saw uh, partial reconstitution of the uh, the uh, effector subsets of CD8s and the, uh, the uh, but uh, and partial but no uh, uh, reconstitution of the naive uh, T or B cell subsets at uh, at month eight. But by month 24, uh, the, T, uh, the naive T cell subsets had resolved and there was uh, no difference between the long COVIDs and matched controls. Uh, and similarly, uh, there was similar resolution of the naive uh, B cell subsets as well. Uh, in terms of activation of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the myeloid uh, series, we had seen activated uh, monocytes at three uh, and eight months. Uh, and this uh, continued uh, out, uh, out to, to, to 24 months uh, in the long COVID. Uh, and similarly, uh, we had uh, seen uh, activation of uh, uh, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, which was more marked than in the monocytes, but no change, uh, no difference in the activation of uh, monocytoid dendritic cells. Uh, but by 24 months, the uh, activation of the plasma cytoid dendritic cells had resolved. Well, there was no difference between the two groups. And similarly, although we saw differences at four and eight months or uh, in the uh, PD-1 expression on CD8 memory T cells, uh, this again had resolved at uh, 24 months. Uh, uh, we'd also seen uh, increased TIM3 expression on uh, memory CD8 T cells, but again, at, at three and eight months, but again, this had resolved by 24 months. Uh, we've been looking uh, in a preliminary way at uh, serum profiling. And uh, again, harking back to one of the earlier talks, we've seen uh, at four and eight months, an increase in uh, a, a, a S100A uh, protein uh, 12, uh, and again, this is an alarming uh, or a danger associated molecular pattern uh, molecule uh, with upregulation of inflammatory uh, processes. Uh, and this was still raised at eight months and we're doing the 24 month uh, 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 analysis of that as we speak. Uh, interestingly, uh, this protein has been seen to be elevated in Kawasaki's disease and associated with the severity of acute uh, COVID-19. So uh, at the moment, uh, I think we can say that COVID co convalescence is char characterized by prolonged immune dysregulation, regardless of the symptoms uh, that lasts out to at least four months. Uh, but uh, long COVID has an initial uh, diffuse immunological footprint, 
that's characterized by increases in type 1 and type 3 interferons, uh, and also uh, then increases in activation of plasma cytoid dendritic cells, but not monocytoid dendritic cells. Uh, there is initial depletion of certain subsets of naive uh, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and B cells. Uh, uh, and this may be uh, bystander activation. Uh, this, uh, uh, and then uh, there's also uh, increased uh, uh, populations of uh, 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 CD8 memory cells uh, expressing uh, molecules like PD1 and TIM3. Uh, we have other data that suggests some of this peripheral dysregulation is associated with uh, c activation of uh, CNS uh, and uh, the kinurin pathway. Uh, there's gradual resolution of this dysregulated profile by 24 months, but uh, maintenance of uh, raised uh, interferon beta. Uh, what the cause of this is, we're not sure. Uh, I think most of those hypotheses have been talked about at this meeting. Uh, we've looked for antigen persistence within the plasma cytoid dendritic cells and monocytoid dendritic cells in peripheral blood and haven't been able to convince ourselves that that's the case. We're in the process of correlating these results with a range of standardized tests like uh, COG state, the VAS fatigue, uh, and uh, MRC dyspnea scores. Uh, and we're currently repeating uh, these experiments on uh, groups of people that we followed uh, after the Delta and Omicron uh, wave. Uh, and as I said, some of the effects of vaccination will be presented this afternoon. Uh, we are interested in uh, looking at tissue uh, antigen persistence. Uh, most of this work was uh, led by a guy named uh, in the lab named Chan Fetzafan. Uh, Gail Matthews and David Darley put together the ADAPT cohort and had the really great idea of uh, you know, recruiting people with the uh, prevalent coronaviruses as the control group, uh, which I think was critical. Uh, uh, and then there was input from uh, uh, da Dan Daniel Wilson, who helped us with the, uh, the, the model. Uh, and Stephen Kent uh, and his group uh, who helped us with the uh, determination of the ACE plasma levels. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Time for questions for Tony. Uh, Tony, those are great data. I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to will be discussed this afternoon, but you touched on this issue that had a lot of play in the popular press that people who had symptoms of long COVID when vaccines were first rolled out said, oh, I got my vaccine and now I'm better. Uh, do, are there any systematic data of uh, the uh, acute effects of vaccination on symptoms associated with long so, COVID? So, um, so the, the biological, well, the, the effects on the, the, the antigen specific populations will be presented this afternoon. Uh, at the moment, I guess we're not seeing a clear, obvious correlation uh, between those. And, you know, uh, almost all that population has had vaccination. Uh, and, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, a third of them uh, have resolved, right? So um, it's, it's hard to, to know from those data. It's a very small sample set now. Um, but. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I guess I can't comment on that from the data we have. Uh, it's such uh, great data. Uh, you know, so many of the uh, cytokines uh, are all mediated by JAK-STAT, mm -hmm. uh, and you have this persistence at 24 months at least of uh, interferon beta. Have you thought about looking at people who are on jack inhibitors at the time of covid and who maintain jack inhibitors afterwards i mean they're used across all types of immune mediated diseases from rheumatologic to ibd to psoriasis do they have a different prevalence of long covid uh, is it um, we, we have tried in a completely separate cohort for sort of separate reasons. We've been, we've been following uh, 
uh, a bunch of people, particularly with Wallenstroms and follicular lymphoma. Uh, and we haven't seen a lot of COVID infection in those patients because they went to ground basically. Yeah. You know, they've they've sure. locked themselves up and put themselves away. So, so um, and and all of those have been vaccinated. They've been very um, and and now have things like Evershield on board as well as the vaccination. So we are continuing to follow that group of patients, but at the moment we haven't seen a huge amount of COVID in those people because I think they're just all being so careful and you know a lot of them have become hermits um, uh, it, just to, to add i mean given that it they're it's now used in psoriasis and diseases sure. where you know far less uh, might be an interesting cohort to yep, absolutely examine. yeah i mean i've got a bunch of people who i'm not following formally but i see in the clinic who are on uh, all sorts of immunosuppression for lupus and scleroderma and those sorts of things and I mean, it's completely anecdotal, but none of my patients have long COVID, right? Yeah. Tony, great data, thank you. Uh, so two, two questions, one is for the PD-1 and uh, team three was yeah. on the CD-8, I, I, yeah. I missed it. There was a uh, memory CD-8 or SARS-CoV-2 specific? So it, was, it, was so it wasn't, no, it wasn't antigen specific though, Again, some of that data might be presented this afternoon, but um, on that, that was total memory no, CD8 T cells. Okay. Yeah. And the second one for the, you, you briefly touched on the conclusion, on the interpretation. When I saw your yeah. data, activated PDC, monocyte, yeah. type one interferon and type three, uh, my first interpretation would have been persistence of the antigen, but it yeah. doesn't seem to be the case. So, well, uh, I, I, do I don't think, think we've excluded that completely because yeah. we haven't looked at the tissue, tissues, yeah. but yeah. certainly, you know, I was wondering whether we'd actually find it in the monocytes or, or the plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And when we've done that staining with what we think are quite specific antibodies, we, we haven't been able to show it in peripheral blood. Yeah, so my yeah. point was if you can speculate, if you think is antigen persistent tissue, if you think this became like autoimmune sure. like, what, what is your, your taking for the data you have until so now? I still think it's worth, so I'll, I'll correct that. So we, we have seen some antigen persistence in those cells, but we're not seeing a difference between the two groups. So, um, and, and we're still working through that. So we've done about, I think we've, last I looked at the data, we'd done about 11 in each group of the 30. So we've still got more to do, but they look exactly the same. You know, there's, um, there's no evidence of, uh, but, you know, I think, you know, persistence in, in, in places like the gut or, or even in the respiratory tree. And I think, you know, you might be able to get at the respiratory tree through th things like induced sputums and those sorts of things, um, rather than doing a BAL or something, which would be, you know, uh, a big intervention for these people. Uh, hi, Tony. Irene. Great yeah. talk. Very elegant work. Um, I wanted to ask actually a couple of things. One um, has to do more with the association that you saw with interferon and with pentraxin um, mm -hmm. 3. So did you control for disease severity on that? Because I wonder if the pentraxin so, 3 was just a surrogate for so, that. So we did. So, so it's interesting. Pentraxin 3 fell out in the model, but not. It, but we didn't show a difference uh, on the, on the one-to-one -one comparisons. Ah, interesting. Um, okay. But when we when we redid the model, taking out those that went to ICU, um, because none of the matched controls had gone to ICU. So when we 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 truncated, I think we lost two or three out of the long COVIDs, and then and then re-ran the analysis with the match controls on that truncated data set we didn't see any difference I from see. the 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 data the patterns of the data remained exactly the same I and see. the levels of significance stayed the same interesting um my other um i guess uh, so I, I should just say though but and i think um in the previous talk I think you know it was a it made a really good point that I think we have to distinguish long COVID from from complications of myocarditis Absolutely. and so you know uh, separately uh, almost all these people had cardiac MRIs and didn't have any 
you know, substantive uh, differences between the two groups in terms of the readouts of their cardiac MRIs. Great. Um, my other, I guess, suggestion slash question is if you are going to pursue the measurement of the spike antigen, because you have the perfect controls, including the um, regular, I guess, coronavirus, um, the one that was brought up yesterday, the David Wald paper, looking at the spike um, yeah. antigen in the serum. So so we've been looking at both. Uh, so we, we with the intracellular staining, we've been using both a nuclear capsid and a, and a spike uh, antibody. Um, and we've been pretty careful with trying to make sure about the specificity of those things. But we haven't looked in serum. Uh, we haven't looked at, we've looked at nuclear capsid in antigen in serum and we don't see a difference, but. They did not either. The nuclear capsid yeah. was only during acute yeah. infection and yeah. then in the long ones it was just the spike. Yeah, so um, we haven't done that. Yeah, yeah right. I think that would be interesting because yeah. you could speculate that it's, you know, you wouldn't find it because monocytes are such a short lifespan and yep, it's a sure. recycling population yep. but you know if they are in the tissue the macrophages and they're spitting yep. out antigen you may find it sure. in the serum but not in the actual circulating cells so it might be a good idea because you have the sure. perfect controls i think yep. that's really an important strength of your cohort yep. thank you perfect thank you thank you very much thanks